Hi, my name is Peter Wu, and for the next hour or so, I'm going to be telling you about how I converted the nose section of a scrapped Boeing 737 into a personal flight simulator in the basement of my house. I started this project almost 10 years ago, and the simulator became fully operational just in the last year. This is the kind of project that's never really finished, but at this point I would say it's about 90% complete. Now, the two questions that I inevitably asked about this project are, number one, why in the world would you ever want to do that? And number two, what did it cost? Now, the first question is generally asked by airline pilots, uh, most of whom rate simulator time somewhere between a kidney stone and a root canal. I'll get into the details in a bit, but the main reason that I did this is I just love airplanes. And as for the cost, suffice it to say for, that for what I spent on this, I could have had a really nice used Cessna 182. And in the end, I came out ahead because my gas bill is actually a lot lower. And I'm really happy with what I ultimately created. It's a highly realistic, fixed-based, dual-control simulator with dynamic force feedback. I do want to emphasize that in spite of the fact that I have a few advanced ratings, I am, at the core, a private pilot with a great love of airplanes. I've never made a dime from my aviation activities, and I have no financial interest in any of the things that I'm about to discuss. The goal of my project all along was to create a fully immersive cockpit simulation of a glass panel Boeing 737, like a Dash 600, 700, 800, or 900. Collectively, these are referred to as the NG, or next generation models. Now, getting back to the why, I do own a real airplane. It's a T-34, an old military trainer, and I fly it as much as I can. So I already have an appropriate outlet for my aviation obsession. But I read about some of the early pioneers in the home airline simulator community, and I really admired what they'd done and thought, wow, that's really cool, and that would be a really interesting project. And to tell you the truth, when I started, I had no idea how far I'd fall down into this hole. Another question that I'm asked fairly often is, why the 737? Why not a fighter jet? Why not a big jumbo jet like the 747? Why not an airliner with a reputation for sports car handling like the 757? Well, there are a number of factors that led me to the 737, but the main reason is it's probably the easiest model to simulate because of a wide availability of parts and software. And the reason for that is the 737 is the most popular airliner that's ever built. Boeing built the first model in the 60s, and total production in all its variants just passed 10,000 airframes with an order book of a couple of thousand more. Many of the classic models like this one have already been scrapped, so parts availability is generally very good. And the cockpit of a next generation model like this one is relatively easy to simulate because of the large glass cockpit displays. And I'll be talking about how that's done during this talk. Now I say relatively because I think when I'm done talking, you'll agree with me that this wasn't an easy project. The other factor is that there's a robust training market for the 737 because of all the airframes in operation. The competition in that market has driven down the cost of that training. So there are a number of manufacturers of hardware and software specifically for simulation. The professional training market spills over into the home enthusiast market and everyone benefits from lower cost. So when I got started in this hobby in 2007, I brought a cockpit that was built specifically for that home enthusiast market. This is a very popular hobby in Europe where it's much more expensive to own and operate actual aircraft. One of the vendors in this market is a guy named Art Mayalyea who builds home cockpit setups in Florida and ships them all over the world. His business is called Northern Flight Sim. The configuration that I bought from him included dual link controls made from real Boeing yokes, control columns, and rudder pedals, and a frame and a shell that allowed me to mount some real Boeing molding to make for a more realistic appearance. The gear was pretty nice, and it was engineered to take up only about 8 inches below the floor with its dual control mechanism. The outer shell was made out of heavy fiberglass that broke down into four pieces, each not necessarily light enough, but certainly small enough to be carried by two people. So I acquired some basic avionics and real seats for this setup. There are a number of manufacturers of simulated avionics, but most of them are a far cry from the real thing. I also felt that my cockpit was lacking in realism because of the flooring and the way the plastic trim rattled every time you brushed up against it. I also didn't like the fact that it was open in the back. I know that real 737 cockpits are pretty tight, and I wanted to feel that when I walked in and sat down. So I really wanted this structure in the picture located aft of the first officer's seat. It holds the, most of the circuit breakers and the fold-down jump seat. I also wanted a cockpit door, and I wanted to try and use as much real Boeing hardware whenever practical. 
So I set my eBay account to send me an email every time a listing with the words Boeing 737 appeared in the title under the category Aviation Parts. And one day the email came and one of the listings was for this scrap 737 nose section. It cost me $8,000 to buy it and another $5,000 to have it shipped to me. This is a photo of the actual airplane when it was still flying. It's United Airlines 737-322 that came off the Boeing assembly line in 1988. United operated it until 2008 when it was sold to a boneyard in Walnut Ridge, Arkansas, where all the useful parts were stripped, including the cockpit windows, which are very valuable. So when I bought the nose in 2011, it had probably been sitting outside exposed to the elements for about three years with no windows in the Arkansas dust and rain. The boneyard that sold me the cockpit offered to make any cuts that I wanted, so I marked up some photos they'd sent. I wasn't really sure how far the control structure extended underneath the floor, so I didn't ask them to do anything too dramatic. The day the cockpit arrived, it was a lot bigger than I expected. Uh, I had rented a telescopic forklift thinking that I could easily slide it under the door of my tea hanger. Now, I happened to occupy an end unit that has an extra wing on it that would have been perfect for a project like this, but the cockpit was too tall to get under the door. So I had this unanticipated problem that I was going to have to solve pretty quickly, like in the next hour. Fortunately, I had a really good relationship with a shop on my field that had some extra space in a large box hanger, and they allowed me to keep the nose there for the first few months. At the time, no one else had attempted to cut one of these uh, into small enough pieces to get inside the house. Many people had taken actual cockpits and cut them down to size and then placed them in a garage or an outbuilding. My friends, some of them AMP mechanics, thought I was crazy to want to cut it up. They suggested various things like, oh, just put it in the garage and insulate the doors and you can air condition the space or, you know, remove a wall and slide it into the house and then put the wall back or even just, you know, just build a new house around it. But I live in an area where real estate is really expensive and I didn't have room for this entire thing in my house and I knew better than to wife, ask my wife's opinion. So... I set out to remove the parts I needed with a plan to scrap most of the aluminum. And to do that, I would first have to make it small enough to fit in my tea hanger. So I had to figure out how much of the bottom could be removed while still removing the flight control mechanisms. To do this, I started out by cutting large sections of skin next to the nose gear well. Now this is not 0.032 aluminum like you find in a piston single. The skin in this section is about an eighth of an inch thick, and to cut it I needed a large cutoff wheel tool that I rented from a local tool dealer. What I found inside was an incredibly complex maze of ducts, wire bundles, insulation, and cables, and all of it was covered with a very thick layer of dust. This picture is taken through one of the sections that I cut, looking through inspection panels in the nose gear well. You wouldn't believe how well packed this area was before I removed most of the contents. The wire bundles were so thick that I didn't even bother with diagonal angle cutters. I just grabbed a die grinder and sawed right through them. It took about a month to get to the point where I could separate the gear well. I had the cockpit sitting on some old tires to protect my hangar floor, so I strapped a larger part to my pickup truck and then I used a hand cable winch uh, connected to the side of the hangar to slide the gear well over the hangar floor. After physically separating the pieces, I took some time to round out the sharp edges with a polishing disc. Now, I want to take a moment to emphasize that if you ever decide to embark on a project like this, it's critical to have a healthy respect for the tools and wear personal protective equipment at all times. Cutting these pieces involved high-speed tools requiring a firm hand and familiarity with the equipment. I was absolutely religious about wearing safety goggles, and in spite of that, the only injury I received in the course of the project was a metal shard that made it around the edges of my goggles and into the sclera of my eye. Luckily, a doctor friend of mine was in the next hangar over and removed it pretty quickly because, boy, that was pretty uncomfortable. After fully separating the nose gear well, I hauled the pieces off to the scrap metal dealer where they paid me about 50 cents a pound for the aluminum. I made at least 10 trips to the scrap metal dealer and I probably got about $1,000 of the cost of the nose back by selling them my extra aluminum and copper wire. Now that I had the bottom half removed, I had a brief opportunity to look at the flight control mechanisms under the floor. And I say brief because I was under a bit of time pressure to get the nose out of my friend's hangar and back into my own space. So I went and rented the telescoping forklift again, and I used a towing strap rated for 5,000 pounds. I ran this strap through the P3 windows and was easily able to lift the uh, cockpit up. And I set it down on a large farm trailer that I bought off of Craigslist. As it turns out, the nose would be sitting on that trailer for the next four years. <laughs> 
Now that the flight deck was finally in level position, I was able to walk inside for the first time. I was really pleased with what I found, seeing that most of the trim and throttle quadrant was in pretty good condition. The windows and the seats were missing, but I knew about this prior to buying it. And you can see that all the avionics modules had also been removed, including the expensive starter switches that are located under the partially removed panel just above the main windows in the center. I knew this going in, and it didn't really matter to me because I was building a glass cockpit 737, and then my avionics would be different. The circuit breakers I've been after were in pretty good shape. I actually had previously purchased a set of circuit breaker panels themselves on eBay, but I was lacking this structure that makes up the back wall of the cockpit. So this is the first officer side, and the captain side is smaller because there's a small shelf that can be fitted out as a second jump seat. Now, this is a kind of love at first sight sort of moment when I was standing in there. There's this incredible beauty to the metalwork on the floor with these enormous rivets and aluminum surfaces scratched by thousands of factory workers, mechanics, and pilots over the 20 years the aircraft was in service. I even wanted to keep the galley in the lab so that visitors would have the experience of walking into the cabin and finally turning left instead of turning right to settle into seat 24C. It took just a few tie-down straps to secure it to the trailer and I was finally able to move it into my T-hanger. The next year or so, I spent stripping out the interior down to bare metal. Starting from the back, I was able to remove the galley module fairly easily because it had simple connections. There's a half a dozen bolts holding it to the floor, and one large one secures it to the top. There are various power and plumbing connections, but once those were identified, it was a fairly simple matter to just pop the module out. The lab itself is much more complicated, and I was just happy it was serviced before the airplane was scrapped. So having removed these two major sections, I was left with the circuit breaker modules and the cockpit door. This cockpit door is the post 9-11 version, so it weighs about 100 pounds, and it was fairly straightforward to remove when open, and due to the sensitivity of this topic, I'm not going to say any more about it, other than to say that the door itself is really sturdy and secure. My next problem was how to remove the circuit breaker walls in the back of the cockpit. Looking online, I found this video that Boeing gives to its showing the livery of the actual airplane being delivered. And I found this part of the video that shows how the circuit breaker modules were installed. Now, you all caught that, right? You saw how the circuit breaker modules came in right at the end? No, I didn't either. So what I did was I slowed down the video so that you can see what actually happens. So here comes an installer with the main instrument panel. You can see he's carrying it easily because it's made out of aluminum. It's really light. He's still cinching it down. When another installer comes in with the FO side circuit breaker structure, closely followed by the captain's side. So this told me that the circuit breaker structures had to come out as modules. Now it took quite a while to figure out all the structural attachment points, but eventually I wrestled both of those modules out. Having completed those tasks, I now had access to the business part of the cockpit and all the plastic trim. Now, when the airlines freshen up the paint in these cockpits, they just come in with a brush and some gray paint, and they just paint over the fasteners. Many of these look like they hadn't been removed in some time, and because the nose had been sitting out in the weather for four years, there was a lot of dirt in the threads, and many of these fasteners were really, really stubborn. So I found this product at Home Depot called PB Penetrating Catalyst that was the best thing for loosening these up, but even with that, it still took quite a while to remove everything. The next phase of the project was to start cutting it into sections. So now I had to decide to, how to make my cuts so that I was able to reassemble the nose later. Some of the geometric relationships would be critical, so I needed a way to preserve those relationships. What I came up with were some steel indexing brackets made by a local metal fabricator. These feature a bolt welded to one side and an eccentric hole on the other. And I asked the fabricator to punch some holes in the other part of the angle to use for mounting. Prior to making any cuts, I clecoed these brackets into place and assigned them a letter code since the fabricator had not punched the holes in the same place in each bracket. I think most people uh, know what a cleco is, but for anyone who doesn't, it's essentially a temporary rivet. Um, they allowed me to set the position, then remove the brackets prior to cutting a section, and then after the pieces were separated, I installed the indexing brackets with actual rivets. So having come up with a system to get the cockpit back together, I used a die grinder to start cutting, and I started by removing a large section of the top. 
which I slid down the side with a system of pulleys attached to the ceiling of my tea hanger. Even if I had help, this would have been challenging to do without the pulleys because the top was about 10 feet in the air as it was sitting on top of the trailer. It would have required a small scaffolding system uh, and a bunch of people to lift it down. So having done that, the next step was to remove the sidewalls aft of this major bulkhead, which left this section remaining. At this point, I had managed to find most of the windows from eBay and other online sources. The forward P1 windows and the aft P3 windows are each secured with dozens of fasteners, and I used, knew that I could use those to index the top to the bottom. So what I decided to do was to cut the remaining top off as one piece, which had the advantage of being easy to cut because there was so little metal involved. And this was actually one of the first pieces to make it into the basement of the house. Um, the big advantage of removing this in one piece was that I knew the geometric relationship of the mounts for the overhead avionics panels would be preserved. The disadvantage is this is the heaviest piece in the entire sim, about 150 pounds. It can be carried by two strong people, but to lift it in place requires three to four. The remaining vertical structure turned out to be the most challenging section to cut. And the reason for this is the very close spacing of the ribs at the front of the airplane. I started by making two vertical cuts roughly in line with the inboard rudder pedals, and you can see one of those cuts here on the right side. There's a close-up of that vertical cut. It's a thin black vertical line that comes down uh, just on the outboard side of that inboard rudder pedal. And this scheme would divide the remaining sections above the floor into three pieces. So then I made the cuts along the floor line, which allowed me to remove the two sides. I again used some pulleys attached to the ceiling structure in the hangar to remove the sections and then lower them to the floor, which left one center section remaining, and this was fairly easy to cut at the floor level. Now, because the spaces were so tight, it required some creativity to cut the walls at the floor. Some people have asked why I didn't use a plasma cutter in this situation, and the main reason is that my hangar is an end unit and the power comes in at the other end. There's a 15 amp circuit breaker, but by the time the wire gets all the way to the end of my hanger row, it was basically limited to 12 amps. That's not nearly enough power for a plasma cutter. So instead, I used a combination of different size die grinders. All of these used the four inch wheel and they varied in the size of the neck. Rigid made a really nice uh, low profile one that allowed me to get into some of these tight spaces. And then I also discovered a tool called a crosscut saw that I bought at Harbor Freight, and that was useful for cutting very thick structures. My tool of last resort was the reciprocating saw, also known as a sawzall, which is another tool that requires a steady hand and can surprise you at uh, inopportune times. One of my hangar visitors at this point referred to the project as a boat because it kind of looked like that. And you can see the flight controls in the throttle quadrant were still in place on top. So I divided the floor into two sections to make them easier to transport. And afterwards, I jacked up one end to reposition some of the tires holding the section in place. I wasn't brave or stupid enough to get under this thing, but I did uh, take some time to take some pictures to start planning how I was going to interface the flight controls. So now about three years into the project, I had it cut into pieces that were almost small enough to get into the house. Instead of bringing the telehandler to the airport again, I just drove the trailer over to the equipment rental yard and rearranged the pieces into vertical position. I was planning to put the whole project back in the hangar for a few more months to split the floor down the middle and then remove the flight controls. Up to this point, I've been playing a bit of a cat and mouse game with the management of my airport. I didn't see this as any different than any other home-built aircraft project, but they definitely didn't see it my way. So my project had been a bit of a secret up to this point. I'd rearranged my purse pieces very early in the morning and had everything on this trailer and was driving back to the airport just before 7 when I noticed the airport manager standing at the entrance gate drinking a cup of coffee. When he saw what I was towing, his jaw dropped to the ground and I knew I just had to keep driving. In other words, I was going to have to move the project out of my hangar to my house that same day. Now, the only place I had to put it was in my driveway. Unfortunately, I don't live in one of those communities with a homeowners association and rules about what you can park there because this eyesore sat there for another couple of months while I continued to get it into small enough pieces to get in the basement door. This is a good time to give the floor sections a good bath, given all the dirt that it's made its way in there. These are the rudder pedals looking down below the floor. I also spent a lot of time cleaning up the cable. These two hammer-shaped structures at the bottom are part of the rudder and nose wheel steering mechanism. Prior to cutting down the middle of the floor, I removed the control yokes, the column crossover tube shown in the center, and the pitch trim drum that's shown at right. You can barely make out the throttle quadrant and the pedestal just inside the garage door in the background. 
Here's a picture showing the bases of the control columns and their associated wire harnesses. And this picture was taken after all those components had been removed. Having made the cut vertically down the middle, I gave the floor one last thorough cleaning, and you can see the galley module there on the left side of the trailer. And here's the floor after being split. Each half came in through the basement door. These pieces look enormous, but remember they're made out of aluminum, so they can easily be carried by two people, and each piece was no more than 75 pounds. The next step was to move the pieces into the basement. So I screwed some large eyelet bolts into the joists in the ceiling, and I went to Home Depot and found the biggest, thickest cable ties I could find, and used them to secure the cockpit floor to the basement ceiling. You can see a few of my indexing brackets here in the midline, and you can also see that I've reinstalled the flight control linkages, which are horizontal structures that cross the midline. Virginia had an earthquake a few years ago, and I certainly didn't want this thing falling over. And as it turned out, it was going to be in this vertical position for about a year. So I started off by reinstalling the flight controls, and I kicked myself for failing to make index marks on the crossover tube that links the two sides together, but it was fairly easy to align the yokes with a level. And the main reason the floor was in this vertical position for so long was for the interfacing of the flight controls. It was around this time that I started hearing about an affordable dynamic force feedback system for do-it-yourself flight controls. And I bought this system made by a guy in the UK named Ian Hopper. The company is called BFF Simulation, and what it does is add force feedback to custom flight control systems. This is the most affordable way to add this functionality. Ian sells you an interface card for each axis, and then you attach a heavy-duty brushless motor with built-in position encoding. This is pretty much the opposite of a plug-and-play system. Ian's happy to give you advice about what motors to buy, but the design of the flight controls themselves is totally up to the end user. So I sat down with a mechanical engineer friend of mine, and we did a few back-of-the-napkin calculations to see how much force this system would need to generate. The forces for the real 737 are out there on the internet, and I knew the dimensions of the controls themselves. So after I acquired the motors, I built a couple of shelves out of sheet steel that I used to mount the motors and associated electronics. These shelves serve structural functions as well, serving to keep the two floor halves in proper position without putting shear forces on the control linkages. The motor uh, runs on 24 volts and have built-in position encoders. As the pitch axis is the one that requires the most force, I fitted this motor with a 10 to 1 planetary gearhead. Here are some additional shelves. The long gray shelf in the middle contains the roll axis motor, and you can see the tooth belt that connects to the Boeing flight controls. The circuit boards are for the force feedback, and I also installed some fans to provide additional cooling for the heat sinks on the boards. The large green tube at the bottom is the Boeing crossover tube for the pitch axis. For the yaw axis, I mounted a motor off to the side and fitted one of the Boeing controls with a large tooth pulley. And I added kill switches to each axis. A few years ago, I owned a Beach Baron that was subject to an onerous circuit breaker airworthiness directive. I saved all 13 of the circuit breaker switches that were removed as a result of that AD and repurposed three of them here. This video shows the roll and yaw axes moving, as well as the stick shakers. Uh, this was the testing phase while the floor was still in vertical position. Once the flight controls were done, there were a number of other interface tasks that needed to be completed prior to putting the floor back down. Here's how I interface the brakes by drilling holes in the Boeing parts and fitting them with springs and sliding potentiometers. This is another shelf near the brakes that has the interface for the brakes and stick shaker. There's a 24 volt power supply on the left and a USB interface card made by a company called Fidgets on the right. Because the interface card uses 12 volts, there's a solid state relay that, when activated by the USB card, supplies 24 volts to the stick shakers. Two of the input channels on the card are used to read the brake position. I repurposed many of the cannon plugs that I recovered during the disassembly of the airframe. I used these plugs to make larger components modular to aid with disassembly. And this is looking through the hole on the AVX pedestal mount on the floor. And you can see that the pedestal mount near the uh, top of the photo here. This was just before putting the floor back, back down after all the cables have been tied up. You can see that there are numerous power supplies and USB hubs at the bottom right and large red and black AC cables that run to the larger power supplies beneath the floor. So finally I was ready to put the floor down into position. This was surprisingly top heavy so I was happy to have some help doing this and two of us held it in place while a third person placed wood blocks underneath. 
And I was really happy when I put a level on the floor and found that it was perfect, both from side to side and front to back, and my custom must have been pretty precise. The structure was then reassembled on top of the floor. The top was easily indexed to the bottom pieces thanks to the dozens of mounting holes in the P1 and P3 windows, and here's the P3 window on the captain side, and you can see how many fasteners there are. I had saved all the hardware from the disassembly, and I used as much of this as possible during the reassembly process. The vast majority of fasteners used by Boeing in this part of the airplane are number 10s, and the variations are fairly obvious. Early on, I established a system where I marked parts with a Sharpie pen as to where they went and the date, and then I took a picture of the part. And so when I came upon a part, I simply looked back in my photo collection on that date, and I can see exactly in the sequence where the part came off. Now remember up to this point I had planned to retain the galley in the lab, but it, it turned out I didn't really have enough space in my basement to do that. I also figured out that I'd be flying a lot sooner if I stopped the project at station 277, which is the big bulkhead you see in the bottom of this photo. That would allow me to stop at the aft part of the circuit breaker structure, incorporate the cockpit door, and have some space left over to build some shelves to finish off the back. So the remaining part of the floor went off to the scrap heap, and the galley and lab were eventually sold on eBay. The galley went somewhere overseas and is probably in an airplane again. Uh, the lab went to a guy in California who wanted to install it in an off-road camper that apparently sees a lot of vibration. He had tried various parts from Home Depot to try and make a working lavatory, and they'd all rattled apart. I begged him to send me pictures of this thing installed in the back of a camper, but uh, I haven't seen anything from him yet. But what I was left with was this structure here. So I gave the remaining structural pieces a good bath, and you can see how I built this back up piece by piece. I got lucky with the planning because the resulting structure clears the ceiling by less than two inches. You can see in this video how light these pieces are. Now I'm reasonably fit, but I'm certainly no bodybuilder. This was the final assembly step for the shell structure, and you'll see me lining up one of the indexing brackets on the right side right there. The more vertical piece on the right is held loosely by a couple of bolts to allow for a little bit of play to engage the indexing bracket. It took a little bit of jiggling, but it all came together pretty easily. And here's what the shell looked like when it was completed. So now the project shifted into a different phase where I would be installing avionics and various controls. My flight deck includes real Boeing flight controls, a throttle quadrant, starter switches, and fire panel. Everything else was manufactured for the simulation market. The items I have working include 171 enunciators, 372 switches, and 65 rotary encoders, which is the technical term for a knob. By modern standards, you don't need a ton of computing power to run one of these. The simulation itself is not super processor intensive, but it does benefit from having high-end graphic cards. My main computer runs Windows 7. It's a custom PC with an Intel i7 processor and a ton of fans because I didn't want to mess with having to keep the water topped off in a liquid-cooled setup. I don't use any overclocking. There are two other reasonably fast computers that are connected via hardwired Ethernet network. And the simulation itself runs on a program called Prepared, which is made by Lockheed Martin. This is based on Microsoft Flight Simulator, which Microsoft stopped developing in 2009. Lockheed Martin acquired the assets and used the underlying engine to make customized projects, many of which are for military users. But they also make a version available for professional flight simulators, and that program itself costs about $200. So this program runs on the main computer, which has two video cards. And those video cards run three short throw projectors, which provide the outside visuals on a 120 degree spherical screen. A warping and edge blending software from a company called Immersive View stitches the projected images together. And the result is not as realistic as the collimated displays used in high end level D simulators, but it's actually pretty good. And more than a few people have had some minor motion sickness in my simulator in spite of the fact that it doesn't move at all. Now, the problem with the base Boeing 737 model and prepared is that it does not fully model all of the aircraft systems. For example, the base model has one fuel pump, but the actual aircraft has six of them. So you need an add-on piece of software. There are several of these available on the market, and I use one called ProSim 737. This is an add-on that originally cost about $600 and is now shifted to a subscription model. It's actually a whole suite of applications that models all the avionics, including the autopilot and the flight management system. ProSim handles all the glass displays, and it also has an audio application that does the cockpit sounds, as well as an instructor module that can be run from an iPad.
The really critical thing that ProSim does is handle all the hardware interfaces, which are various USB devices that are used to connect the enunciators, switches, rotary encoders, and potentiometers that measure the position of the flight and the engine controls. One of the ProSim apps is just for displays, and it can run on a separate computer or for a network. So I have one computer for the captain side and another for the FO side. Each computer runs a primary flight display and a navigation display for its respective slide side. And the captain side computer runs the upper ICAS, and the FO side display runs the lower ICAS. And finally, each computer runs another app for the flight management computer, one for each pilot. ProSim handles the hardware interfaces really elegantly. The application supports a wide variety of hardware, including the ones that I use that are made by vendors like Fidgets, Flight Deck Solutions, Pololu, and Leo Bodnar. These boards are designed to accept bare wires from the various avionics and encode signals with a USB interface. What this allows you to do is to energize anything that uses electricity, including enunciators, solenoids, motors, and noisemakers. You can also detect the position of a switch or knob and measure a flight control that's moved. So here's an example of how those interface boards are used to connect a real Boeing part to a Windows computer. This is a real Boeing fire panel that I reverse engineered to provide its full functionality in the simulator. In the real airplane, when there's a fire, the handle lights up and the bell goes off. The bell is really loud, gets your attention right away. You pull the handle to extinguish the fire, but the pulling of the handle also has a number of other actions, such as shutting the fuel off to the affected engine. So you wouldn't want someone to be able to pull the handle unintentionally. To that end, each handle is fitted with a solenoid that locks it into place until a number of logical conditions are true, the most important one being that the engine is actually on fire. So this one panel, has 14 enunciators, 18 switches, and three solenoids. There are three handles because the auxiliary power unit's also an engine, so it needs a fire suppression system itself. The reverse engineering was fairly straightforward. I was able to find a wiring diagram for the panel, which explained how the solenoids work, but many of the switches and enunciators on the panel were handled by two internal logic boards, so I just removed those logic boards and used a multimeter to figure out the remaining wiring. And then I used the existing cannon plugs to connect to a custom panel where I'd mounted two USB relay cards to manage the handles and a Fidgets 0 16 16 board to manage the remaining items. These connections are fairly simple. Single 28 volt power supply can be used for each relay channel, all the lights, and the interface cards themselves. A separate 5 volt circuit is for the panel backlighting. And this basic scheme is repeated over and over again in the simulator on multiple components. So that's the avionics. I'd previously purchased a main instrument panel from a company called Flight Deck Solutions based in Ontario. This gear is built specifically for the simulation markets, highly accurate in terms of its dimensions. Now that being said, the main instrument panel I acquired from them was designed to be freestanding, so it required quite a bit of modification to fit in my real Boeing cockpit. The first step was to completely disassemble the panel, tying up all the cables. And in many cases, I had to divide the cables and I added cannon plug connectors to facilitate the reassembly later. The Flight Deck Solutions main instrument panel was a little bit narrower than the Boeing opening, so I added some angle aluminum and painted it to match. And it took many rounds of dry fitting to get this right. This is looking outboard on the first officer's side. The gray and green vertical structure is the original Boeing main instrument panel mount. And the black horizontal piece on the left is a custom bracket that I manufactured to hold the monitor shelf behind the new panel. And here you see that monitor shelf after installation. There are three angled black vertical pieces that each hold a monitor, which is pushed up against the back of the main instrument panel to create the glass cockpit displays. These are just standard PC monitors, and they look fine with a basic VGA interface. The hardest thing for many sim builders is finding a display that's small enough for the middle one, because in the last 10 years or so, displays got so cheap that no one makes them that small anymore. One of just a few structural differences between the classic cockpit I'd purchased and the next generation model I was simulating is the position of the landing gear lever. I was using a real Boeing lever that bolts onto the airframe, and in the NG model, the gear lever mechanism is about two inches inboard of its position in the classic model. So this required drilling out the rivets holding the bracket and moving the bracket inboard. There's also a minor cosmetic difference between the clear plastic wheel and the classic and NG models. So I drilled out the rivet on the old yellow, larger classic style and replaced it with a reproduction one like the newer, smaller model that's seen on the NG models. Now, this is just one ex example of uh, where the real thing is vastly superior to reproduction products made for the sim market. 
A real Boeing landing gear lever has a solenoid that prevents the pilot from raising the landing gear unless certain logical conditions are met. There's also a red override trigger in case this system fails. The lever itself has a really heavy duty feel to it, and it's pretty simple to reverse engineer as it has just a few micro switches and power to the solenoid. So after being satisfied that the main instrument panel was going to fit, I'd reached the point where I was pretty much ready to start installing avionics, and I decided to start with the autopilot and EFIS controls that are right below the glare shield. The reason for this was that I wanted to use the original Boeing mounting brackets, and Flight Deck Solutions didn't design their stuff to fit these. This required major modification of both the Boeing and the FDS gear, and larger trigger clamps were needed to line up the components and screw them into place. For convenience, I used some click bond adhesive nut plates inside the avionics modules to avoid riveting. And the angle of the mounts and components were adjusted several times until it was level. And here you can see the glare sheet components fully installed in the monitor shelf waiting to receive monitors. So at this point, I connected power and data cables and tested the glare shield components again. The monitors were mounted and the instruments were aligned in the openings, which is a lot easier before all the bezels are installed. And here's what it looks like with the lights on and the bezels in place. All those cables coming off the bottom are for the various lights and switches that are on the main instrument panel. My next big obstacle was fitting this module containing the lower ice cast screen and dual FMS keypads. So here's another structural difference between the Classic and the NG model 737. The bay for these components is about two inches wider in the NG model. Boeing grabbed this space from the rudder pedal well, making both the pedal itself and the space more narrow. But my problem was I had a classic cockpit and classic rudder pedals, so I used the top of the FDS bay and the bottom of the Boeing bay and mated them together. There was an avionics shelf inside the FDS bay that I cut to fit inside the Boeing one. And on that shelf, I mounted all the interface cards for the enunciators, switches, and gauges that are on the main instrument panel. There's also space for a PC power supply that gives both 12 and 5 volt power. The 12 volts for the interface cards and the 5 volts for the panel backlighting. And before mounting the three screens, I tested everything on the bench and aligned the screens. And here's the result after installation. This shows the rudder pedal in its most aft position. You can see that the pedal clears the bottom of the bay by only about half an inch. The trim doesn't quite match up, but most people don't even notice. Eventually they'll start scrapping more NG models and I might be able to find the right trim piece. So after the throttle quadrant and avionics pedestal were screwed into place, here are the power supplies and USB cables that were previously installed on the floor when it was still in the vertical position. And the pedestal box was installed on top. And this was uh, fitted with various USB interface boards. And they were secured with another click bond product. It's called an adhesive tie wrap mount. And here's the pedestal after installation of all those components. The throttle quadrant's a real Boeing one that was modified by Art Mount. Mayalia at Northern Flight Sim to provide full motorized functionality. Art fitted it with motors and switches, and I interfaced it to make the auto throttles, trim wheels, and speed brake move the way they do on the real airplane. I could spend another hour talking about this one component and how it was interfaced. The overhead panels were next. Boeing designs them to swing down for easy maintenance access, and the FDS versions are so accurately sized that they just put fit right into the Boeing mounts. The only thing that I had to modify were the quarter turn fasteners at the forward edges. Here's a shot with the panels hanging down and looking aft. You can get a sense of what a complex wiring project this is. And here's a picture of the overhead panel in operation. Most of the avionics here were manufactured by FDS, and they're essentially plug and play USB devices, but many of the hardware components are real Boeing parts. This includes the toggle switches and the rotary start switches, which have a solenoid to release the starter at a certain point in the sequence. The gauges are made by a company called Flight Illusion, and they're made to fit in the FDS overhead perfectly. Before installing the trim, I took some time to interface the nose wheel tiller. This control is used in most transport category jets to provide better maneuverability when the aircraft is taxiing. In the real airplane, this is linked to the rudder pedal mechanism, but for the sake of simplicity, I elected to set it up as a separate control. This was done by making loops at the ends of the Boeing cable, and then fitting the ends with springs attached to the airframe. A short connecting rod attaches to a sliding potentiometer to the spring, and that pod is connected to a USB interface board to read the position. And you can see how that works here in this video. The spring makes a fairly large excursion, but the way that it's wired with the control rod to the potentiometer, there's a fairly short distance that has to be measured. 
Several of the trim pieces were damaged in the process of removal, so I repaired these with fiberglass on the back and then used some 3M flowable finishing glaze to fill in the cracks. This one's from the FO side, just below the P2 sliding window, and you can see a large missing piece on the right side. So after adding a new piece and sanding, they were ready for paint. Having completed the bulk of the wiring and repaired all the trim, I was ready to install everything. And these are the P2 sliding windows during the paint process. The paint itself is just a Rust-Oleum High Heat Primer number 249340 uh, with a top coat of matte finish. Here are some rudder pedal skids before and after polishing. The before is on the left, the after is on the right. I think Boeing gave up on putting paint anywhere on the floor a long time ago, so this area gets a lot of wear. Um, these are pretty easy to polish up with just a DeWalt variable speed polisher. The trim below the windows had originally been Boeing gray, but I found a good off-white that matched the trim in the NG Model 737, and this is Rust-Oleum Clean Metal Primer number 778-0830. The basic installation scheme is to work from it aft to forward and bottom to top because of the way that the trim pieces overlap. And once all the trim was installed, I brought in the circuit breaker modules and put the door back together. I had about six inches of space left after the circuit breaker modules, so I built some custom shelving to finish off the space. And for the entry, I built a short staircase out of wood and covered it with diamond plate aluminum. The cut edges of the airplane were covered with some oil cooler hose that was split lengthwise, and then I just drilled some holes in the skin to secure the hose with tie wraps. And the shelling components were attached to various nut plates that were already on the airframe. And I used the space to store training manuals and a few pictures from the construction. So this video was made uh, about a year ago. You can see that I haven't painted over the exterior yet, and I'll get to that eventually. For years, just about any social occasion at my house has included a trip to the basement, and now it also usually in features a flight or two in the sim. There's frequently a line, so having some stuff on the shelves gives those waiting something to look at. I've discovered that the visuals look best when all the overhead lights are out, so I added blackout curtains on the windows to keep the daylight from interfering, and the cockpit looks really dramatic when everything's running, and I still get a big smile on my face when I walk up into it, duck my head down, and settle into the pilot seat. When I'm flying it by myself, I usually sit on the first officer side because it's a lot easier to reach the gear and the flap handles. And as I said at the beginning, about 90% of the hardware works, and the next phases of the project will include um, calibrating the dynamic force feedback system, upgrading the outside visual system, and wiring more of the cockpit ambient lighting. And of course, the biggest thing on my to-do list is learning how to fly the airplane well. I can take off and land, I can program the FMS with a basic flight plan, and I can use the autopilot. It's not pretty, but I can do it. And I would encourage anyone considering a project like this to just go for it. Like any home-built aircraft project, I've had my moments of frustration, but I'm really happy I chose to take this on. I picked up a number of useful skills, and I made some great friendships in the course of it. There's a worldwide community of flight sim enthusiasts, and here are a few of my favorite sites for interacting with them. And these are some of my favorite avionics vendors. As I said earlier, most of my manufactured for the flight simulation parts come from a company called Flight Deck Solutions. It's a great company. Uh, it was formed by Peter and his brother Steve Koss. They started the company in their garage, their basement, and it's grown into something really fantastic. Uh, they make very high quality parts. They're totally worth the price. I have had the cheaper stuff, and I can't say enough nice things about them. Um, Sismo Soluciones is also a good company. Uh, Sim Parts in Germany and uh, Jeremy in the UK um, also provide um, really useful bits uh, for finishing off a cockpit. And finally, the interface vendors. Uh, Flight Deck Solutions makes several of these boards on their own. Uh, Fidgets makes a much broader range of applications. Uh, Palulu turned out to make some of the more critical interfaces for the throttle quadrant and the unique functionality that it has. And then Leo Bodnar makes a very popular joystick emulator card. And every one of these flight simulator projects is going to need a joystick emulator card. And Leo's is very easy to use.
So one thing that I'm asked really frequently about this project is what did you need to get that done? And I needed a lot of things. I needed time, I needed space, I needed the ability to learn a number of new skills. And the internet made many of those things possible. But really the two most important things to get a project like this done are a really big basement and a really understanding wife. So I really wanna thank my wife, Alex, for her many, many years of understanding as I was getting this project completed. And now that it is done, the thing that gives me the greatest joy is when kids come over to the house and I'm able to share my enthusiasm for aviation. Uh, a lot of these kids have ridden on airliners before. They've kind of looked at the cockpit from the door. Maybe they've stopped to talk to the pilots, but they've never gotten a chance to actually sit in the seat and take the controls and fly the airplane. And giving them the chance to do that, to me, is the most rewarding thing of this entire project. So this is the end of my presentation. I hope you've enjoyed listening. If you have a project of uh, this type that you're thinking about doing, uh, go for it. Have fun. My contact information is here, as well as my website. Um, feel free to write me if you have any questions about how I made this project happen, and good luck.